grenade-sized explosive devices with the power of a nuclear bomb and other unconventional weapons pursued in secret at the Pentagon are the subject of Sharon Weinberger's new book, Imaginary Weapons. She spoke about it recently at Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, D.C., for just under an hour. Um, tonight we, we do welcome um, Sharon Weinberger. She's the author of Imaginary Weapons, A Journey Through the Pentagon's Scientific Underworld which is an insightful, at times quizzical, look at the questionable science and outrageous history of behind ongoing weaponry development in the depths of the Department of Defense, specifically the hafnium isomer bomb, advanced in theory, flawed in application. Um, she will talk about the book, and then we will, um, as usual, open it up for questions. And at that point, we do ask that you use our audience microphone. Um, if you can get there, it does keep the talk audible and um, does help out. So. We ask you to do that, and um, Sharon is the Editor-in-Chief of Defense Technology International, a bi-monthly editorial supplement to aviation week and space technology. Um, her writing on science and technology has also appeared in Slate and the Washington Post magazine, which is where this book originated in article form. So thank you very much for coming in tonight, and please help me welcome Sharon Weinberger. Thanks for coming. Um, you know, since writing this book, a lot of people have asked me what motivated me or what kind of led me to writing a book. And certainly it didn't start off being about what the book is about, which is a nuclear isomer bomb. It started off, I think, much earlier um, from my work in defense industry and then later writing about the defend defense industry. And this is a world, you know, that exists around the Washington Beltway, I think, in a very unique way and in many ways is itself a scientific and a defense underworld. And so I think that the origin of this book really goes back to um, probably 1999 or 2000 when I was preparing to leave a small defense company in Northern Virginia where I was working as a defense analyst. And the next week I was starting work as a defense journalist who's on, on the other side of the fence. And um, the head of the company sat me down to give me sort of his farewell spiel. And you know, usually this is when people talk to you about your future career and things that you might accomplish and what you might want to do. And the head of this defense company instead started talking about the fallout shelter in his backyard <laughs> and how he was preparing for a nuclear war. And he talked about it in the way that many in Washington might talk about their barbecue, you know, how he had built it and how he maintained it and what he put in it. And then went into an extensive dialogue about which way winds might blow after a nuclear weapon goes off in Washington and how much dirt you need over your fallout shelter. And um, you know, we kind of carried on like this for a little while, and it was a very normal conversation, so I thought that this was the weirdest conversation I'd ever had. And, and there was something very typical about it, because these were the types of conversations we had every day in defense industry, and, um, and it seemed so normal. And then going over and writing in the defense industry and having colleagues there, you know, we would continue to run into these very strange things, you know, weapons that just never seemed they could work or, you know, things just so strange and yet they existed, you know, people proposing lightning guns and sort of solve it all weapons. And, you know, a lot of this book, I think, comes out of dialogues with my friends and colleagues in the defense industry that starts with a basic question, how did it get here? <laughs> you know, how did it happen? How do you get these ideas that are so strange? And so I began thinking that it'd be nice to write an, a narrative, you know, an article or a book about how a weapon becomes a weapon, and particularly about how strange weapons and strange ideas become weapons. And the problem was I didn't know what weapon to write about. <laughs> so I started off thinking I'd write about nuclear bunker busters, this um, sort of obsession in the current administration that you could build a nuclear weapon to to um, you know, get deep underground targets, and you know, I couldn't really find an interesting story around it. And um, I was at a um, at a talk in Washington in late 2003, and someone asked about something called a hafnium bomb, and the name itself was so intriguing, I, I just kind of had to find out more about it. And this book is an outgrowth of that one question, you know, how did a hafnium bomb come about? So I'm going to start off by reading just a short passage from the book about how I first learned about this weapon. It was on Halloween, October 31st, 2003, that I first learned about the Pentagon's plans to build a frightening new bomb. Not just any bomb, but a weapon so powerful it could melt human flesh, penetrate deep underground into hardened bunkers, and evaporate whole city blocks with one fell blast. It would be unlike any bomb mankind had ever created, producing a powerful burst of gamma rays, delivering fatal doses of radiation in just seconds. It could create a powerful fireball like a nuclear weapon, spewing radioactive material far and wide. 
In the hands of a suicide bomber, such a weapon could prove devastating, allowing terrorists to threaten entire cities with just a single explosive-laden car. I would later learn that the Pentagon believed the Russians had been looking at their own version of the bomb, and so too perhaps were the North Koreans. The military in official documents was calling this new bomb a revolution in warfare, comparable to the discovery of nuclear fission. And foreign journalists were issuing dire warnings that a new arms race was on the horizon. It was a bomb so terrifying that one official from the Central Intelligence Agency had followed its worldwide progress for over a decade, and the State Department's arms control experts, concerned about the threat of a new era of proliferation, were calling up Pentagon officials demanding explanations. And in the fall of 2003, when I first learned about this bomb, the Pentagon had just assembled the nation's top experts to look into mass producing the critical material to be used in it. It was a material so precious and expensive that a mere gram could cost as much as one billion. Building the facilities to produce the material could run the tens of billions of dollars. A tidy sum, but worthwhile perhaps if the alternative were to allow foreign countries to surpass the United States in military power. But most frightening of all, such a weapon once built might not fall under any existing arms control agreement. The system of checks and balances meant to contain weapons of mass destruction, however flawed and ineffective, would collapse into a meaningless pile of papers. The world could be facing a new arms race of frightening proportions. So how was it then that the Pentagon had embarked on a quest for a new super bomb and no one in the United States seemed to notice? Maybe it was because in the fall of 2003, the U.S. National Security Establishment was look busy looking for um, non-existent weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Or maybe it was because Congress, with little public attention, was getting ready to roll back a decade-old ban that prohibited work on new nuclear weapons and so-called low-yield weapons or mini-nukes. Or maybe it was because this frightening new bomb never existed. It was, in the pure sense, just an imaginary weapon. As it was, I only learned about this weapon by chance through a last-minute decision to attend a seminar on Capitol Hill, one of dozens of such briefings that take place in Washington every day. Stephen Younger, a senior Pentagon weapons scientist, was making the case for why the country needed new nuclear weapons, off the record. It was a typical crowd that showed up at talks in Washington on nuclear weapons, a mix of grim-faced policy wonks and aging social activists. A woman identifying herself as a psychologist raised her hand to ask a question, only to launch into a 10-minute diatribe against war and violence. Younger looked physically pained. Someone asked about so-called bunker-busting nukes, nuclear weapons designed to penetrate deep underground. Younger cheered up because he liked this topic. And then a man behind me asked Younger what he thought about the hafnium bomb. Younger, a nuclear weapons designer by training, just chuckled, as if the question were some sort of inside joke, known only to a select few that could really appreciate it. After the talk finished and people started shuffling for the door, I turned around to catch the man who had asked about the bomb. Couldn't help but notice that someone had passed him an official use-only report and he somehow possessed an air of authority. I barely caught the name of the bomb, but I was certain I'd never heard of it. What's a hafnium bomb, I asked. He squinted at me for a moment and then smiled mischievously and said, call me, handing me a card and excusing himself quickly. The plain white card read Peter Zimmerman, scientific consultant. I returned to my desk in the Senate press gallery, and for a few hours I forgot about the Hafnium bomb entirely until I was about ready to leave work for the day and spotted the plain white card sitting precariously close to the edge of my desk. I paused for a moment thinking about all the things I had to do that week, and then I picked up the phone and called him. The next day, sitting over coffee in the bottom of the Russell Senate office building, Peter Zimmerman began to explain what the Hafnium bomb was. Like many physicists, Zimmerman spoke with his hands, sketching out diagrams, formulas, and equations as he spoke. He leaned over the table, grabbed my notebook, and began tracing out the shape of the second metastable state of hafnium-178, oblong, spinning on an axis that looked like an elongated football. Using stick-figure diagrams, he tried to show how this charged-up form of a regular atomic nucleus called an isomer would decay over time, emitting its energy in the form of gamma rays. Doing what physicists call back-of-the-envelope calculations, Zimmerman explained what made the obscure hafnium isomer so attractive to the Pentagon. It packed one hell of a wallop. One gram of the isomer material would have the same ex energy as one-third of a ton of TNT. The explosive force, if it could be released, would approach that of nuclear fission. I nodded my head, pretending to follow a bit of what he was describing. I didn't understand much of anything. And then it got really weird. The Pentagon, according to Zimmerman, had started up a project to use this material to build a far bomb far more powerful than any conventional explosive. The notional concept, he told me, was a nuclear hand grenade. And the whole thing was based on an experiment conducted in 1980, 1998 that involved a dental x-ray machine and a scientist from an obscure university in Texas. Dental x-ray machine, I asked? A second-hand dental x-ray machine, he corrected. There was another issue. Prominent scientists had repeated the original experiment and found nothing. No results. And yet the Pentagon was starting down the path of what looked like it would become a massive weapons project. So it's like a nuclear weapon, I asked. 
yes, he replied, but it'll never work. 